Alexa. I am a software engineer uh, at Red Hat on the Kernel RTS team, lovingly known as the Kernel Real-Time and Scheduler team. We like to call ourselves the Kernel Rats. Uh, first, thank you to Anne for the invitation, as well as to Arnaldo, who is both the godfather and one of my many mentors. Um, thank you so much for your help and support through all of this. My day job is primarily doing bug fixes, issues, and customer and partner engagements, as well as backports for CentOS Stream 9. Um, here's a bit of a rough overview of what we'll be talking today. We're going to talk about the genesis of this fun journey with the bug, uh, do some archaeology with x86 and my IRET, discuss mitigations and workarounds to the patch, uh, print K as a suspect to our problems, and then print K as a culprit, and then I'll shoo in some backporting and some reflections. So before we get into the genesis, um, just a little quick uh, frame of reference for myself, a, a, a bit of an overview. Uh, I joined Red Hat in 2022 after completing my Bachelor's of Science in Computer Engineering. Uh, joined the Kernel Rats team as a Franken kernel maintainer for CentOS Stream 9, RHEL 9, and RHEL 8. Uh, before this, I really only had some basic exposure to operating systems in Linux. Um, some user-based code here to emulate OS primitives such as pthreads and pthread barriers, mutexes, and uh, inodes and so forth as well as a dummy K-mod uh, here and there before joining the industry. Um, why am I sharing this? Well, this is just an attempt to convey a story through my lens. So in this first section, uh, it's going to be sort of the meatiest section here. Uh, we're going to talk about how this whole saga started. And to get a good perspective, we have to dig into what is the bug. Well, what is the bug? Sometime around 2023, a partner engineer filed a bug against kernel RT in one of our RHEL kernels. Uh, naturally, this fell into the laps of the KRTS team, and this bug in question was only specifically at a specific uh, git tag, and was only reproducible from that point onwards. Uh, it was considered a performance regression and interfered with the collection of VM cores and dmessage logs for crash analysis, so by all accounts it was something that we had to investigate. Um, the last slide is a bit of a high-level overview. Um, here's a better synopsis of what was filed. Um, the description is right there in italics. Uh, NMI panic sometimes fails to start the second kernel for kdump. So in one of our kernels, uh, panics through NMI would prevent the boot process of the kdump recovery kernel. Uh, this could be reproduced 100% of the time with their uh, print case spammer module. Uh, no dmessage logs or VM cords to be saved for crash analysis. Occasionally, no backtraces or important messages printed. Uh, at times, this would cause the machine to hang on panic, requiring manual reboots of the box and other sorts of manual intervention methods. Um, the expected behavior, of course, was the KDOM kernel should start uninterrupted and save a VM core and dmessage logs. Uh, the observed behavior, what we ended up seeing, was that the KDOM kernel does not start. The system either resets without saving any of this critical information or just hangs. And with this in mind, it becomes apparent that there is a real bug here. And now that we have the behaviors and characteristics fleshed out, let's move on to take a look at the reproducers. Uh, for a moment, I want to set up a real lean definition of what an NMI is. Uh, profilers, watchdogs, any other utilities that need a special context, which can't be ignored, leverage this feature uh, so that it may record spent CPU time and determine whether or not the kernel is stuck somewhere with interrupts disabled. Uh, there's also the case of buggy or corrupt or damaged hardware. Uh, for the sake of this talk, NMI uh, is non-maskable, which means it cannot be ignored. Um, here are some more terms that I'll be throwing around, all very lean definition for the sake of time. Uh, KDump is a utility that creates crash dumps for kernel crashes. Uh, IPIs are shoulder taps or interprocessor interrupts in multi-CPU systems. And IPMI is a set of standardized management systems on enterprise hardware. Uh, and syscuttle is a mechanism for modifying kernel parameters at runtime. As a quick heads up, uh, here are some of the configs that may affect system behavior. In RHEL 9, we have the following configs enabled. Uh, I want to make a call out to that we have the preempt RT code matched as of 9.3, but we do not have config preempt RT enabled. Uh, we do have config have atomic console, and we have config hertz set to 1000. So to reproduce the issue at hand, uh, there needs to be a few prerequisites for a given system, in our case, x86 with 8.250 UART serial, uh, that need to be met. Uh, first is support for IPMI and ACPI drivers. Uh, next would be support for open IPMI and related tooling, such as IPMI tool. This is how we trigger the NMIs. Alternatively, you could use the big red, big red button on your box if you'd like to. Uh, then it is uh, KEXEC and KDEP support. And without all of these, we can't really reproduce the bug cleanly. So it's highly recommended that we have these checked off. And I'm going to quickly glaze over some of the reproducer guidelines. Um, we're going to install an affected kernel, enable the serial console, set up and configure KDump, 
set crash kernel to some reasonable defaults, uh, set some syscall tunables, build and insert this print case spammer, and then trigger the panic through NMI. And here's the reproducer script. Uh, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but just ignore the lengthy description for now. As you can see, we just set our tunables, we insert the print case spammer, uh, we sleep, wait until the console log buffers are totally saturated, and we blow up the box using an NMI. Uh, here are the important bits of the reproducer. Um, as you can see, the workers themselves are pretty simple. There's only four of them. On the left is the function that gets passed to the workers. Uh, we just print K and sleep. On the right, we allocate some memory for the workers, and then we go through the worker array, uh, assign a K thread with the worker function that we've seen passed onto the left. So I've done a lot of talking. Um, so I'm going to go through this demo really quickly. Um, here I enter my testing repository. I go into the directory of the kmod. I build the kmod. Uh, this is the recorded demo, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't like doing live demos. <laughs> um, and then I run the test using the test harness that I wrote. Uh, and as you can see, we're slamming the console log buffers. And this is edited for, for the sake of time, but after about uh, 30 seconds or so, we should see some messages to be being dropped, and that's where I trigger the NMI. So if we stick around for a second. Printing. There we go, dropping some messages. And it should be around here that I trigger the NMI. Chassis power control, there we go. We're flushing out all the pending messages, and we should see some traces and a hang any second now. There we go. All right, awesome. So that was really fast. Um, so I'm going to do some screen grabs. And here's a screen grab of the first trace. Uh, we have confirmation that NMI was received on CPU 0. Um, our call trace here makes we, we have some signs from dump stack and panic. Uh, RIP is set to M wait idle, which I interpret as uh, halt and wait for an instruction. Uh, other than that, we can see our NMI trace. Um, it seems like we're doing everything well so far. But here's our second trace. Um, if you notice, we have the hard lockup detector yelling at us for, uh, for CPU 1. Um, we also see that the RIP is talking about a print K CPU sync wait function. That's certainly interesting. We, we see some signs of life from K exec as well. Uh, other than that, in our call trace, we see some calls to serial 8250 console write, uh, console min x record, and then some print K handlers. Uh, once we reach here, we stall. There's no other information about the KDOM kernel. And eventually, we reboot with no VM cores, dmessage logs, or additional journal call logs to be found. So let's clear up some things. Um, we know that in RHEL, config hertz is set to 1,000, meaning that a Jiffy is roughly about a millisecond. That must mean that scheduled timeout interruptible is an effective one millisecond delay. So all we do in this worker function is print K and sleep for a Jiffy. With our rough estimates in napkin math, um, because we're printing about a message a millisecond, we can say that we're printing 1,000 messages a second per worker. We multiply that by four worker threads, and we roughly have 4,000 messages per second uh, slamming the console buffer. Uh, and, and that's printing pretty fast. A lot of messages are slamming the console buffers, and we're slamming the buffers and dropping messages, and we're all out of buffer space. Uh, this is normal, considering that we're running a bit of an unrealistic workload, uh, an exaggerated one that's, that's hammering the console. And it's not something that you typically see. In, in fact, we only really saw a workload like this when our partner engineers introduced this uh, work, work, work scenario to us. Excuse me. The trouble comes when we hit our NMI. So recall, with all these tunables set, uh, when we receive an NMI, we panic. And in fact, we actually have a function that we call from NMI panic context. When we panic, we want to make sure that only one CPU is allowed to execute the panic code. Um, the, the goal here is to stop all their CPUs with some variation of SMP stop and allow the first CPU to proceed. Uh, this allows us to work synchronously. Um, and this is what MI Panic is trying to do here. Um, as you can see, we do an atomic compare and swap, as uh, denoted by atomic compare exchange there. And we essentially check the value of the pointer panic CPU to say, uh, has anybody claimed the role of the panic handler yet? Um, if not, then we just go ahead and panic. However, if someone else has already claimed the role of the panic handler, we call an MI panic self-stop, which is a wrapper for a panic SMP self-stop, which, again, is just a definition for CPU relax, in which we tell the compiler, hey, don't optimize this out. Just repeat no ops indefinitely. Moving on to the heart of panic.c, 
uh, we see that we do the same thing here, actually. Um, again, the goal is to eliminate any need for any sort of synchronization. Uh, we do a similar check as in my panic. Uh, single CPU, what you see is what you get. Uh, but an important side note from the comment up there is that panic by design has nothing to prevent another invocation of panic from actually occurring. We do some buffer formatting, and we print our printk panic message. And because we have config debug bug verbose enabled, uh, we dump the stack and, and print a backtrace. And we then flush the console buffers with uh, config have atomic console set as our mode and bust the spin locks. And I think this is a really good place to start. Um, but first, I, I want to talk about some of my experiences with creating this testing matrix that I'm about to dive into. Uh, one of the things that helped establish this matrix was to create clear success criteria. And, and it may seem simple at first. Um, but when approaching the scenario, it was very overwhelming having to consider all the different possibilities and interactions of different subsystems, as well as this uh, reproducer occurring in different contexts. Um, so it allowed me to create sort of a simple scientific method of sorts, uh, playing around with control variables, introducing new testing scenarios, and so on. Um, so to reiterate, if a VM core was generated after the NMI induced panic, then we succeed. Uh, otherwise, we fail. Pretty straightforward. Um, one important thing to note is that replacing the local NMI with a crash generated by a sysrq trigger generated a VM core. A more interesting discovery, however, was that disabling the NMI watchdog entirely completely mitigated the problem. We were able to generate a VM core in quick succession every single time. Um, of course, combining the two led to similar results. I'm going to jump back to flushing. I had said that the stall had occurred after the second trace with the watchdog NMI, and then we just hang. Um, but because we're in a panic state, we have to flush these pending messages and the ones in the buffer to ensure that no critical information is lost to the user. So in this function, console flush on panic, uh, we're doing precisely that with console atomic flush pending set as our mode. So we're going to jump right into atomic console flush all. And we do nothing crazy here, but what's important is that we acquire a spinning lock that's specific to printk. Printk CPU sync get IRQ save. This lock is a bit of a special one. It's a re-entrant spinning lock that disables interrupts. And if we can't acquire the lock, we just spin forever until we can grab it, and interrupts are restored when we spin. Um, there's a bit of an important disclaimer here that if we're in NMI context, it becomes unsafe to use any sort of synchronization technique, whether it be locking or busy waiting uh, to, or spinning to wait for other CPUs. But there's something here that looks a little familiar to us, uh, printk CPU sync wait. And where have we seen that before? Let's take a quick peek at it first. Um, we just busy wait until the printk CPU sync lock is owned by anyone. But if you remember from our second trace, if we look back to it, we can see that our RIP actually mentions the same function here, meaning that this function was either the fault of the panic or was about to be executed when the panic occurred. Um, let's jump back into flushing. Uh, this is the second half of the, fl of the flushing function, and it's uh, a big do-while loop, essentially, that iterates over every single active console. And then we check for any progress done by console in the next record. Uh, after all that, after we check our progress, we touch the watchdog, and as well as some of these sync functions and RCU um, stall reset functions to keep the watchdog and all these synchronization mechanics uh, happy. And if that's the case, if what we just saw here, which we iterate over every active console, and we touch all these mechanics um, here to keep them satisfied, why is it that we're still getting an additional NMI trace after our first trace, one that was able to, again, dump the stack and supposedly came from the watchdog? Why is the watchdog setting an NMI in the first place if atomic console flush all resets these RCU stall mechanisms and then touches the watchdog? Uh, how are we able to get to a point that we're actually attempting to acquire this re-entrant CPU spinning lock? There's one more thing that I think we should cover that will start to put together the pieces for us. So we have a lot of messages to flush. Um, especially in single CPU mode. So some napkin math says that 115,200 baud uh, divided by 10 bits per transmission character over a serial line with a max line length of 80 characters. That means that a worst case scenario, we're flushing at about 144 lines per second, which is about a 30x decrease from printing at 4,000 messages per second. Um, without the watchdog, we proceed just fine. When we send our local NMI, things go ahead, we panic, k exec and reboot. But it's when we have the watchdog enabled that things do get interesting. Uh, as we saw in the demo, uh, once the console buffers are fully saturated and the local NMI is generated, we induce a panic, uh, just as we wanted to through our syscuttle tunables. But the hard lock detector sends up an additional NMI on top of that, and we supposedly panic again. So now we have two racing NMIs in our system, 
and have entered what some call a nested NMI scenario, where the first NMI invokes the NMI handler, as we've seen, and now the second NMI is latched. We still have some unanswered questions. Um, why do we stall? And why doesn't kexec boot into the recovery kernel and reboot with our VM core and dmessage logs intact? Um, let's try and answer the first question. I have a bit of a theory here. Uh, and it isn't bulletproof as things start to get a little hairy for me, but it's the best way I could describe it. So we have various CPUs printing. Uh, CPU zero receives an NMI, which triggers a panic. We send IPIs or shoulder taps to other CPUs so that they sleep. And then we dump the stack and prepare to acquire the reentrant console lock. Everyone's with me here so far. This is nothing new from our first trace. We've seen this. Um, but in the panic handler, the worker K threads across various CPUs were making good progress. They're now put to sleep. Any progress is now halted. The hard lockup detector, or the watchdog, recognizes this as a stall. CPU 1 receives the NMI from the watchdog as a recovery attempt. The NMI attempts to preempt code in CPU 0, which is handling the panic. Uh, CPU 1 attempts to acquire the reentrant CPU lock held by CPU 0. CPU 1 spins and waits to acquire the reentrant lock held by CPU 0, and this is unsafe. CPU 1 cannot proceed in hand handling the panic until it acquires the lock, uh, and CPU 0 cannot proceed flushing the console buffers until the second panic is handled. So both CPUs are in NMI panic context, and we reach a deadlock due to contested, contested excuse me, print K, CPU sync, get, IRQ save, lock. So we know why you hang. Uh, it's a deadlock. We've, we've diagnosed our bug to an extent and discovered what the cause is, but what about the K exec kernel? Why don't we K dump? The second question actually stumped me for some time. Um, why is it that these racing NMIs from this weird deadlock prevent the KDump kernel from even booting? Uh, and how come there's little to no trace of, of KDump logs being printed? So I had to do a little bit of archaeology. And, and one of the benefits of, of doing some Google Foo with LWN is you stumble upon articles like these. But it, it wasn't until I found a nice corner to hack in um, last year, I believe, at LPC Richmond, while waiting for some kernel builds to mitigate this uh, deadlock, that I actually give this a really, re a really good read through. Uh, and it was really informative, a really great article. Um, and despite it being good, I, I did notice that it was written 12 plus years ago. So I, I thought I had stumbled into something interesting. Uh, we don't have time to go over the full article in painstaking detail, but I'm going to quickly summarize the bits that are relevant to us. Um, this is a bit of a gross summary here. So some details will be glossed over. Um, in x86 architecture, the CPU will not exec another NMI until the first is complete. However, an IRET instruction or a return from interrupt will consider an NMI complete and will re-enable NMIs. This is really bad if we hit a exception, such as a page fault or a breakpoint. Uh, the NMI is at risk of not being put back to its original state prior to the exception, and this new state permits other NMIs to preempt us. Uh, non re code, we have fixed per CPU stacks, it's a recipe for crashes. The IRET from page fault uh, means that NMIs were not allowed to use vmalloc memory, uh, memory is mapped on the task's page table, so the first reference will result in a fault, as we saw was just bad. Um, no faults or no exceptions, we note k-probes and my handlers, and no vmalloc memory makes storing dumps really, really hard. So what was the solution? Uh, the solution was to save a variable on a per CPU NMI stack, so that when the first NMI comes in, we copy its stack from onto the stack twice, and then set the special variable. Um, on return, we clear the variable, and we call IRET to return back to its original state. And if we have an additional NMI that comes into the system, we check the special variable on the instruction pointer. And if we are set, we are in a nested context. So we trampoline to code that handles nested NMIs. And that last point is a bit of craziness, and I'm going to get this explanation wrong. But in this trampoline area, we must not allow the new NMI to overwrite us, essentially. Uh, the new NMI examines the instruction pointer, and if we're in this trampoline context, we return without doing anything and discard the second NMI. This is because the initial NMI saved a copy of its stack frame twice, which means we have three copies, actually, of the NMI stack frame. The first one is written by hardware, but in nested NMI context, it's overwritten by the second NMI. We have one copy to return from the handler when the first NMI is complete, but the last copy will be used to return to the trampoline that continuously re continually retriggers the first NMI. So like a trampoline, we keep jumping back to this trampoline area and back to the first NMI and retriggering the first NMI until it's completely done with whatever it was doing. And having learned all this, what did I do with this information? Uh, absolutely nothing. I, I told myself that this article was over 11 years old at the time and this was a solved problem. And I, looking at the patches, I, I assumed that it was a solved problem. 
So it was an interesting read, but I just discarded it at the time. I wanted to keep moving as this bug really had me stumped and I was really trying to mitigate this from the deadlock side of things. By the end of that week, at the final LPC evening event, I had received an email from one of our partner engineers. Uh, and keep in mind that we had been in close communication throughout this whole process. I had been sharing my testing matrix with him, new discoveries, mitigations of disabling the end of my watchdog, uh, patches and workarounds. And while we have this nested into my scenario fresh in our minds, let's take a look at the email. And this was the content of the email, and it's an x86 NMI IRET patch. And uh, it, it's pretty ironic, but well, let's take a look at this patch and let's read it together. Um, ignore NMIs during very early boot. When there are two racing NMIs on x86, the first NMI invokes the NMI handler, and the second NMI is latched until IRET is executed. If panic on NMI and panic kexec are enabled, the first NMI triggers panic and starts booting the next kernel through kexec. The second kernel, uh, note that the second NMI is still latched, and during very early boot of the next kernel, once an IRET is executed as a result of page fault, the second NMI is unlatched and invokes the NMI handler. However, an NMI handler is not set up at the early stage of boot, which results in a boot failure. So remember from our call trace, kexec did show some signs of life. Uh, aside from the deadlock, what's happening here is that the second kernel is booting, but it's swallowing the latched NMI. So in this patch, all we really do here is we trap the NMIs on boot and the no op. Uh, we don't really care about local sources on boot. And even if they were external NMIs, we're not really properly handled to set them up in the first place. So we insulate the kernel from NMIs until it's handled, uh, prepared to handle them, excuse me. Uh, everything from here on is a little fuzzy to me, but we discard the NMI that prevents us from storing our VM core. And keep in mind that in some instances, kexec does help us reboot our machine, so it actually solves the problem of just hanging after the second trace. But uh, one thing I asked myself was, doesn't the NMI workaround address this already? Well, it only works if the kernel is in an NMI exception and currently knows about it. The second kernel is completely clueless and unaware that there's a latch NMI and just swallows it. The vmalloc uh, page fault from kdump merely exposes the problem. So now if this patch implemented and tested and solving the issue of the kdump kernel, uh, our bug is fixed, so we're scot-free, right? We're still running into that deadlock, and this is an abrupt change of pace. Um, these next two sections are, are pretty short, but with this we'll be able to unravel a little bit of the mystery here and, and talking about printk as a suspect to our problems. Um, if you don't know what printk is, it prints stuff, usually to a console, in this case, x86, 8250 UART serial consoles. And I could have told you in the previous descriptions that this was not only reproducible at a certain tag, but bisected to a specific commit. But where is the fun in that? Um, specifically, it was contained to a small backport from an RT upstream patch set. Uh, this patch set in question was in an effort to merge the RT code uh, into CentOS kernels sometime around August of 2022. Um, this commit was part of a printk update from Linux RT Devel. Um, here is the commit in question. This is the bisected commit. Printk add infrastructure for atomic consoles. And this commit specifically was the one that introduced changes to panic, but more importantly, the atomic console infrastructure, uh, including atomic console flush all, where we saw our deadlock in our nested nested NMI panic scenario. And to keep myself honest, here's the diff uh, going over exactly what we just discussed <laughs> a few slides back. And for reference, I'm in the Linux RT Devel tree, uh, checking to see what tag contains the commit in question. Uh, I'm doing a git log from this uh, point onwards, spits out a ton of results. So with, this actually does line up with some of the development work that was happening um, around LPC Dublin 2022 with some of the printk uh, reworks by John Agnes. Um, I have some more uh, expanded git log history as well as a lot of the links to some of the LKML patches in my appendix if you'd like to take a look at my slides afterwards. Um, but I'm going to do a quick detour as I think this is pretty central to the talk. We don't have time to watch this video or even do a proper discussion of it, uh, but I do think that it's an excellent talk and one of the core motivations for the rapid development and gargantuan effort that's gone into the printk effort uh, so far. And I urge you to watch this. And I will include this link along with many others in my appendix, as I feel without this talk, my talk is certainly incomplete without this context. So it's, this is a minimized TLDR, but if you're going to take away anything from that video, uh, or that talk rather, take away these points. Uh, why is printk so complicated? Well, it's complicated because we're not only required to print from nearly every context, 
but we're also supposed to be storing messages into a ring buffer that's universally available to syslog, kmessage, and kdump. Uh, ring buffer and console should not be missing any messages on crash, panic, or, uh, panic, or hang, and we also have to try to not be slow. And, and this may seem trivial at first glance, but further inspection of the code and its underlying mechanisms demonstrate how difficult these requirements are in practice. And in fact, after running af into a few print K regressions myself, I've really gl grown to uh, like this quote from, from John Agnes. Um, if it is a part of print K, it is already implicitly on every single line of code. And reflecting on this, I, I thought, well, this is just untrue. But if you really think about it, how many subsystems or, or drivers or, or even user space applications have some variation of print K, dev K message, uh, or any sort of PR wrappers or PR warn, PR info for message logging or debugging. It starts to bring some things into perspective. So we suspect that printk is the culprit. Uh, what, what do we do with this information? Well, lucky for us, um, we have a new version of printk as of August 2023 sitting in, I believe, 6.5.2 RT8, uh, which we had various additions to make NMI panic context much safer, and the bug doesn't reproduce here. Um, doing a git diff of the 519 tag with uh, a commit, more recent commit from the RT develop tree, uh, we can see that the changes to atomic consoles had a massive backlog of changes to overcome, which ultimately had some nice additions. This included UART port locks, SRCU console list iteration, uh, legacy modes for non-atomic consoles, safer takeover mechanisms for console locks, and safer flushing mechanisms in various contexts, including in NMI context, as well as many other changes that made their way into the mainline kernel. Um, this section is a little weird. Uh, I admit that I, I shoehorned it in, but now that we have a patch as a mitigation for the ra racing nested in uh, we need to address that this affected version of printk was still present in the CentOS Stream 9 kernels. And the best solution we determined was to get printk closer to the better implementation that was available upstream for us. So analysis showed that to update every single subsystem that printk touched and depended on was a monstrous effort and required bringing in dependencies to other subsystems as well. Uh, many of the new iterations were dependent on fixes that had come from the main line, and so an update to 6.6 to, to get printk up to 6.6 RT stable required touching basically all of TTY uh, for the UART port lock overhaul as well as additions to 8.2.5.0. Uh, changes to panic.c, NMI helpers, flushing sequences, busting spin locks, uh, SRCU for console list iteration and other safety mechanisms such as special cookies, um, locked up and locked up notations and small bits in Timekeeper and, and other uh, various other subsystems. Eventually, we come to the conclusion that it was necessary to get printk, serial, TTOI consoles, and so on to a point where we, we, we would be sure that we'd be eliminating an entire class of regressions. Uh, and as you can see, the update to TTOI and printk and all of its dependencies was about 1,700 commits worth of effort. So a bit of a gargantuan ask and a lot of uh, man hours of effort put into that. I want to wrap up with some reflections and, and takeaways from this endeavor. So what did I learn? Firstly, the big takeaway here was to not make any assumptions. A sub point to that would be skeptical of everything and to not take anything for granted. Uh, you want to continuously test your assumptions and slowly introduce variables and question your understanding. Uh, next would be to define clear success criteria. And, and while it was obvious to say, hey, no bug seen is a pass, Creating a pass-fail checklist for myself with experimentation guidelines can be helpful. Uh, also, read the freaking source code. Um, if it has an API, call it into Kmod, uh, throw a random printk in somewhere, and break it to understand what it's actually doing. One of the other reflections I had is, is why did we go through such effort in the first place to mitigate this bug? Uh, well, first, we want to be proactive so that we can mitigate issues before they become seen in the field or become the, before they even become catastrophic. Uh, we might go through great efforts to fix bugs that may not be seen at all. And 4,000 messages a second may seem like a fairy tale scenario, uh, but we may never know if, say, 300 messages a second for multiple modules or applications could cause a similar deadlock and nest it in my scenario. And that's a much more realistic scenario when you're talking about anything that takes these print K locks or these console locks at a very, very high frequency. Um, I joked with Arnaldo, who had been mentoring me a little bit throughout these, uh, the, the past couple of years or so, that I would quote him from one of our many exchanges. So, so here it is. Uh, dependable software doesn't spontaneously crop up. It depends on persistent people. Um, thank you to everyone who made this possible. Um, everyone here has had a substantial influence on me. And uh, thank you to the Linux RT users community. And thank you.
So um, now open to any questions if you have any. If not, we can all go about our, our evenings. <laughs> Um, I have a question about uh, your first case. Uh, you said that uh, you didn't understand why KXEC was not happening and cut up, and then you found out that KXEC was indeed happening. Uh, why didn't you see any traces from from the KXEC that uh, that crashed because of uh, NMI? So, um, both in the first and second trace, um, I think. Let me see if I can jump all the way back to that point in the slides. But we do see some signs of life um, loading the recovery kernel. Um, what ends up happening is that because of the page fault um, from vmalloc, um, and because we have these two nested NMIs and the second latched NMI, uh, the, because the second kernel is completely unaware of it being an NMI context, um, the NMI uh, IRET mitigation doesn't work, and so we just swallow it, and we interrupt what we're doing, and we completely stop kexec from being able to save the VM core. But you, you can't have like early boot uh, early boot logs that wouldn't depend on Vima, Vima log. Uh, I don't know. It's, uh... um, to, to the, as far as my knowledge understands, I, okay. I believe vmalloc is, is necessary for storing the, the VM core as well as the message logs. Okay. I could be wrong. There. Okay, so I'm trying to understand fully on the issue of the situation. So the NMI happened, the first NMI happened, and obviously it puts the stack the data there. Mm -hmm. It does the panic. It then starts K exec while in, in, in NMI context, correct? Yes. Okay. So, but the K exec, it should be redoing the IDT tables and all that, does it? Or is this before the IDT tables? Because the, the panic of the nested NMI is usually the, when the, the second NMI, the nested NMI doesn't call this panic. The panic happens when you go to the original NMI. But the question is, if you're panicking, why are you going back to the original NMI that would cause the panic or cause the crash? That's a good question. I'm actually a little unsure myself. Um, as I said, th things do get a little fuzzy for me here. And, but the, be the best way I could explain it is is simply that, is that we, we panic once, okay. we so, start KXX. So basically, I, well, we won't do it here, but please send me an email on it, because I really, now I, I'm interested in knowing exactly how it is, because I, what you've said right now doesn't really explain per, uh, exactly what the panic was. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a little worried that I'm hoping that we did actually fix the bug. So. Right. After this patch, we couldn't reproduce it. No matter, like I increased this to like 8,000 messages per second, and then I did some, uh, in, in one of my scripts, I did a for loop in which I just continuously called additional NMIs into the system while we were had, having this uh, console well, log buffer contention. And right. So from the great words of the legendary uh, Thomas Kleichner, it's like, always understand the problem. Just don't say, hey, I did this, it works. Of course. So. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else?